Now in partnership with the Westport Library's Verso Studios and Quick Center for the Arts and many uh, aggregators of podcasts like Apple and Amazon, it's Oh Brother, Not Another Podcast with me, Trace Burroughs. And me, Migs Burroughs. And uh, Trace and I are both, as former, uh, we call them apprentices in our day, apprentices of the Westport Playhouse. We're proud to have uh, and pleased to have uh, Michael Barker, the executive director of the Playhouse, and Mark Lemos, the artistic director here, and uh, to talk about the history and the future and the, the current, the, the uh, upcoming seasons of the uh, Playhouse. So welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having us. Yeah. So um, can we t uh, talk a minute about, because you were just uh, talking about this coming out of the cave and that's sort of what we're all doing and you're what what is the uh what did it take to to bring the playhouse out of the darkness of covid well it it certainly took a lot of survival time you know during covid and we got through that thanks to generous donors and uh, the government help that helped us a lot we still had to furlough uh quite a few younger members of our staff which was very tough but um, struggling up out of the, out of the, whatever, I don't know what the words are anymore of, of two years of not producing really except in this format on, on laptops and, uh, iPhones and stuff. Um, it's taking a lot. It's as if the muscles aren't quite, you know, we we were in tech rehearsals, technical rehearsals for our first production, which is a big musical next to normal. And we've done big musicals in the past with a lot of scenic elements and all of that. And it's uh, it's more of a struggle than everybody kind of remembered, you know, and partially it's just because the the muscles just need to get back into into focus um, in terms of the artistic situation. I'm finding, you know, there's just as there is a, a problem with, you know, chips fr coming from China and uh, nobody can buy a car. Um, I'm having issues all over the field. The, the casting directors uh, are understaffed. Uh, you know, the scenic painters have taken other jobs. Um, oh. A lot of actors have decided they're throwing their, you know, throwing in the towel and going somewhere else and doing something else and not living in Manhattan anymore. So it's 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 an interesting moment. I'll say that for it. And I I think everything has changed. I don't think we're going back to anything. I think we have to figure out how to forge ahead in the changed environment to be very abstract about it. But are you still having like uh, for the shows coming up, um, you know, social distancing or masks or something like any of that? What's the protocol there currently? Yeah, we're, I mean, we're do we're still doing masks. We're still doing uh, vaccine requirements. Uh, we're not doing social distancing. That's not really been a, a, a advice from public health folks for a while. Yeah. And that's something that the the unions want and that the the audiences want. But I just wanted to to, to not be too down in the mouth all, over all of this because I mean what Mark says is completely true, and particularly as we're in it, it can be it's grueling. Um, I think that the idea of a muscle out of shape is that's the right metaphor. But it's also it is it's like um, it's like you know it, it, I'm. Uh, you you are without this joyful thing for so long, and now it's more. <laughs> and because it's different, it's it's even more than it was before. Because I, I we never would have been making things like we're making them now in 2019. We never would be uh, overcoming the struggles that we're overcoming now in 2019. And so, even as we. <laughs> Even as we struggle along and one, you know, wonder if we can get through to the next day, it's also I, I have to remind myself what a privilege it is to just to be doing this again, um, because uh, we had to we had to time keep and then bail out the boat for two years to make sure that we were ready when it was time to do it again. Um, and I think I think we are, you know, as hard as it say. is, I think we are. Yeah, I mean, the first rehearsal of this show that we're opening with next to normal, it, it was kind of an out of body experience because I hadn't been in a rehearsal hall for two years. I, I, I practically live, sleep, breathe and eat in rehearsal halls, right? <laughs> and, um, and 
I, 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 I have trouble describing the, the multiple feelings that were overwhelming me that day, just seeing everybody doing what they were supposed to be doing. Actors are acting. The music director is working. People are reading through the script. The director is giving his concept. The designers are talking about the set. You know, this all was two years, <laughs> you know, two years of none of this. And I, it was like being reminded of how to speak a language again and how to be with artists, which was just exhilarating, you know, to, to step in that room and have these people so excited to be back doing what they were born to do, doing what they were trained to do. And it's this amazing cast of people that know, they're very aware that they're the mothership here. And uh, they're, they're, they're taking it very seriously. They're brilliant in, in, in acting and, and, and their musicianship and their singing is just phenomenal beyond belief. But there's also this company uh, group think that we've all noticed that is about getting the Westport Playhouse full season up again. We did uh, a live production of uh, John Patrick Shanley's Doubt a few months ago where we would have ended last season. But this is our first complete season, hopefully. And, um, and these performers are just, uh, they're, 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 like, they're like people at the head of a parade holding flag or something. <laughs> Oh, it's it's wonderful to see. Well, a flag, a flag, or a lance with the charge. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess the the upside of this kind of you know challenge is the renewed gratitude. People are saying, um, you know, like you said, I'm back on stage. I'm working. I'm singing. I'm dancing. I'm directing. I'm painting. I'm whatever. You know, there's a, all of a sudden. I think maybe you know jobs are taken for granted, and now it's like, wow, I really like this. I like that job that I miss so much. Yeah. You want to tell us a little capsule of what uh, next to normal is, what what the audiences can expect. I mean, it's a... yeah. I mean, it's a Pulitzer Prize winning musical from I think two thousand eight and um, Broadway musical that uh, is about a subject that is, you know, you, you wouldn't expect to find in a musical. It's about a woman with bipolar disorder, a mother with bipolar disorder, living in a kind of fantasy world and driving her family absolutely next to normal. Um, <laughs> and uh, the, the music and the lyrics by uh, Tom Kitt and Brian Yorkey are, are just as tight as a drum. You know, they, they explore this situation of this family going through all these problems with this woman who's a wonderful person. Um, humorously, sadly, terrifyingly, you know, the emotions just fly around the room. And it's I want to say it's 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 violently entertaining. You know, it's, it's, it's just you you're riveted to the story because you don't know what's going to happen next, and you see the effect it's having on people as they're starting to go out of control, and yet it has a giddy joy to it. I have to say, at the same time, the second act is some of the most moving theater I've ever I've ever watched or listened to. It's just very powerful and. It led me to realize we were talking the other day, some of us at the theater about, you know, I said, it's, it's interesting to, when you think about the great musicals, right, through, through history, when you think about them, what they have in common, the great ones, is an emotional core. I mean, Oklahoma has an emotional core. South Pacific has a huge one, you know. Even My Fair Lady is a, is a love story that you, you, know, you want these people to succeed. A chorus line, you know, perfect example. And so a lot of them have very serious subject matter when you think about it. I mean, South Pacific came out when we were still, we were still in the South Pacific, if I recall, fighting a war. And, um, and it addressed that. This addresses, you know, addiction, bipolar disorder, family units. And the really wonderful thing about it, besides the amazing singing on stage, I mean amazing, um, is that the director's concept, Marco Santana's concept is what kind of turned me on to doing this. He said, you know, I've, I've always wanted to do that musical with a, a Latin and black company. He said, you know, people think this is kind of a white people's problem and it's not. And he said, people in our community don't talk about it. They aren't as open about it. And he said, it's happening in Latin families, in, in black families. And I want to explore that. 
the composer and the and the uh, book writer gave us the leeway to really change some things in the script. Um, they are definitely a family of, of uh, Puerto Rican descent, probably. Um, there are references to that just sort of buried right under the text. Um, there are certain things in the music that change that they allowed us to change. The sex of one of the characters, uh, a doctor, was changed from a man to a woman, which is very interesting. So uh, they, they, they were behind us doing a kind of exciting new version, 100%. And, um, and in fact, so much behind it that Tom Kitt is coming to, to our opening night and doing our symposium the day after, our Sunday symposium. So we're sort of thrilled by that. So Michael, how do we get tickets? Where, when, how? And what's the rest of the season look like? <laughs> you, got, you got to go to westportplayhouse.org because you're listening to this on your, on your iPhone. Um, and it's, it, it, you know, it starts performances April 5th, runs through the 24th, um, and we have the possibility of extending an additional week. Um, I, I would just say, I mean, for every, everything that Mark said is true, it's also hilarious in parts, right? She, she dances a waltz, not a waltz, she dances a, a dance with her pharmacologist and sings <laughs> a song about that. Right. It, I mean, the, the quote is, and I hate, you know, you hate to quote the times on everything, but they said it was, it's a feel everything musical. It really is. It's the gamut. You're, 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 she's in this emotional space. You're in this emotional space with her. Um, I, what's been really interesting for me as where I sit in the, in the, in the place where I don't spend all the time in the rehearsal rooms that Mark does, but uh, I get all I get all of the complaints and I get all of the compliments um, on the front line front line of communication from our from our subscribers especially. And what's been so interesting to me is I did not know how beloved this musical is. Um, it, it's it, to, it I guess it's a little like uh, for my for the people my age, rent was the thing, right? We would sit around the theater kids in the cafeteria singing, you know, five hundred twenty-five thousand six hundred minutes and annoying all the athletes, right? <laughs> the, the next generation, the next group, you know, sort of whatever, 20 years later, or not even quite 15 years later, um, it was next to normal. And so all of these particularly young women are just coming out of the woodwork and saying how amazing it is they're gonna see this here on the Playhouse stage. And when you talk to them about the concept, about uh, Marcos's um, vision for it, it just makes it all that much more interesting because it's not just the same thing that you've seen before. Um, and some of them many, many times. I remember when I saw it on Broadway, I was in a matinee and um, at intermission, I was amazed to be surrounded by going out on the sidewalk, women in their thirties and forties. Um, and they were on fire about it. They were just, they felt like, they felt like the musical was about them. Uh, and, and not that they all were bipolar by any chance, but by any means, but, but it is about mothering and parenting and, 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 and being a spouse, you know, all of those things are, are still inside this, this, uh, what the woman is dealing with and what we watch the family dealing with. Every family has issues, right? There's not a family on earth that doesn't. They can be minor, they can be much smaller than this or much bigger and more, more tragic than this. But we all navigate them, right? And we all kind of hide things from each other. And that's the part of the real fun of the, of the show is, is that we're in on the secrets mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that they're not sharing with the son and the daughter and the husband and the husband's not sharing with the son and all of that stuff. But we know what it is and it provides a great deal of the, of the comedy of the piece. Mm -hmm. What other what those shows you got coming up in the season this year? Um, we're following this show with uh, a play by young Jean Lee. She'll be the first Asian American woman writer we've uh, done on the on the in the main stage season, um, and it's called Straight White Men. It's uh, it's that's exactly what it's about. It's about <laughs> white men and how they behave. It's a father, uh, a, a widower, and his three grown sons spending Christmas together, and. Uh, it's very funny. There's a lot of there's a lot of humor in it. There's a lot of sort of familial brotherly violence in it, crazy stuff, and uh, and then it's quite moving at the end. It's it had a it had a, a terrific runoff on Broadway, 
uh, a couple seasons ago. I was aware of the play when it first premiered at Steppenwolf in Chicago. We couldn't get the rights then because it was already optioned for Broadway. So I'm, I'm very excited about it. Young Jean Lee, the playwright, is actually a, pretty much an avant-garde writer, but in this play, she has, her avant-gardeness is writing a well-made American play, and she really nails it. Um, As an anthropological uh, exercise about figuring out what's going on with these, this kind of person that's caused so much, you know, good and bad, 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 a lot of bad recently in the world. Yeah, yeah. And then we're following that with a, 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 a really funny and very sweet and very touching play by a Canadian, a Korean Canadian writer named Ince Choi. It's called Kim's Convenience. You may have seen the Netflix series that it's based on, or that that the series is based on this play. Ince was the executive producer, uh, but it's run for six seasons on Netflix. It's more of a little more of a sitcom on Netflix than the play itself is, but the play is very touching, very sweet. It's about a Korean Canadian family with a convenience store. Uh, and the issues of that family, the, the, the cultural issues that are different from our issues, say, but in many ways completely similar. Why isn't my 30-year-old daughter getting married? Could she be a lesbian? <laughs> you know, uh, I, I, want, I want her to take over the store. Uh, she, she falls in love with a, with a, a Black guy. Um, it's the sweetest play, and uh, it's being directed by a terrific director named Nelson Eusebio I've wanted to have here for a long time. So I'm thrilled about that. And then we're doing Amy Herzog's 4,000 Miles, which is a play about different generations, uh, a, an older woman in her late eighties and her nephew um, who's kind of screwed up his life comes to suddenly stay with her in, in her apartment in New York. She's a lefty, she's an old time liberal and, um, and he doesn't know where he's at. And that's what's touching and beautiful about the play. It premiered at Lincoln Center uh, quite a while back now, and it's been done by a lot of theaters. And we really loved it. We fell in love with the play. David Kennedy, our associate artistic director, is, is helming that. And I think Amy of... is the kind of artist that uh, particularly subscription audiences at the Playhouse will love. It, she, she writes, she's very much in the tradition of Gurney, of Miller. Of, she makes plays that have a beginning, middle, and an end. You know, it's, it's realism, it's unity. Um, I, I just think I'm, I'm thrilled we're doing a play by her. We've looked at a couple. Yeah, yeah. She's, a, she's, a, she's not only up and coming, she's kind of there now. Yeah. Um, and our, our final production is something I'm really thrilled about. Um, it's a play called From the Mississippi Delta. It's by a woman named uh, Endesha Ida Mae Holland, who died a few years ago. I originally did a production when I was running the Hartford Stage Company, when I was the artistic director there. It was transformative. Um, it transformed the audience. It uh, moved to Off-Broadway for a very successful run. It's a play about black women and uh, it, it, it has a, a great deal of celebration. I don't wanna to say too much about it because it's, it's so beautifully written and it feels abstract, but it's very real. Three actresses uh, play one woman living a life. And that woman is the writer, Andesha Ida Mae Holland. The director is an absolute powerhouse, a young woman named Goldie Patrick. Um, who is a social justice, transformative human being, an amazing person, uh, director, artist, etc., who's agreed to helm this for us. I really am excited that we're going to bring her to the theater and, 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 and share her vision with our audiences. So that's the season for this year. We also do, uh, we do, you know, FamFest, our, our, our uh, shows for young people, we have a, a, a New Works Initiative that's led by David Kennedy and the Assistant Artistic Director, Liam Lonigan, uh, commissioning new plays and uh, workshopping new work so that we have things in the pipeline to move forward. So we're, and we also have a big educational initiative led by Jenny Nelson, our Director of Outreach and Education. And she does a tremendous amount of um, working with various communities um, 
that we want to bring into the theater, both different generations of communities and communities of color. Yeah. And finally, script in hand, right? <laughs> in hand. We, just finished, we just finished the first half of the season with script in hand. We, we don't do that during the main stage season because mm -hmm. there's not space on the calendar, but it'll come back in the fall. And uh, I think Mark Shanahan has <laughs> uh, taken what Annie Keefe built there and has uh, breathed some different life into it. And it, it, it's been really, it's, it's been cool to be back with that. We've done two of those thus far this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always enjoy uh, I mean, I enjoy, you know, I enjoy the plays too. It just, it, there's something about, it just makes you focus on the words and the, and the, and, you know, I mean, not that the, there's nothing wrong with scenery and, and, and stage direction, but it's, it just, we hope so, not. it's so stripped down. No, but it's just, it's stripped down to the story and the characters and it's got a different, it, it just brings something different to the audience. I, but, I did one of those at the community theater. I was the lead character. I just went out and auditioned and, and, uh, my mother came to see it and she walked out in the middle. <laughs> just like, but I never got a clear answer from her. You know, it wasn't like she was like upset. I, I forget what she said. And I mean, she left the water running at home or something. <laughs> yeah, she was, like, yeah. Well, that brings up a point that I wanted to ask Mark about, or both of you, how people want to know what is the process? Where do these plays come from? How do they just arrive on your stage? I mean, what is the, how long, ahead of time are you already working on 2023 how do you Mark, evaluate where do these plays come from <laughs> yeah i mean how do you evaluate so many there's so many things out there do people like if i trace or i wrote a play i'm not encouraging people to do this do you do you accept unsolicited submissions from new playwrights does it have to be something you know already kind of established off broadway how does that work yeah. Um, we, we don't accept uh, uh, unsolicited manuscripts. We work with agents who represent right. writers. And then we work with the writers themselves who very often will tell us about other writers. Um, um, we, it's, it's pretty wide ranging. We, we have begun planning 2023. We just had a meeting about it last week. We have one show in place. We have four more to do. Uh, you're looking for variety. You're looking for um, things that you can afford to do budget wise. That's mm. tremendously important. We can't, if we can't afford it, we don't do it. <laughs> um, we look for things that are, that are not what you saw in the last 10 years, say, if you are a subscriber, um, we want to encourage new voices. So there's always, we're always looking at plays that haven't been produced in the area. Um, we are generally, because we're so close to the city, uh, we're, we're in a less than a 50 mile radius. So that, that keeps some things from being available to us actually, which is frustrating. Um, nobody knows that, but it's, it gets a little frustrating sometimes. Um, however, the main thing is you want to give as much variety to a season as you can. So that if you're coming to see five plays, I always like to think that when we're putting a season together, if you only went to the Westport Playhouse for theater, what, how wide a variety of things could I share with you, you know? And then it also has to do with things that artists are passionate about. Somebody comes to me with a play, I'm just dying to do this play. I'm dying to direct this play. Uh, talk to me, you know, that's basically what happened with Next to Normal. I sat down with Marcos after he did In the Heights and I said, just, let's just talk about things you might do if we have you back. You're such a wonderful director. We talked about three or four things and he came up with this and I like the idea so much of a of a cast that looked like this and and that it dealt with this uh that I said yes so it's it is a bit haphazard to be absolutely honest with you it's the chance encounter somebody tells you you read about a play that just closed in London and you think wait a minute that sounds wonderful let's get the script you know mm. and all of a sudden things are in motion well, it's like, what do they say about luck is 99% preparation? When people ask me what, a, what an artistic director does, because nobody ever asked me what I do. <laughs> ask me what an artistic director does. You That's draw, I can I see by the drawings on the back, you're an artist. Have, I, is, is, it's not even me, this is my son. Um, <laughs> not even that good. Uh, but no, but it's, but it's something about, you know, it, what when Mark talked about planning the season just now, 
my luck in working with somebody like Mark, as opposed to some of the other people I've worked with who will go unnamed here and they don't listen to this podcast probably anyway, <laughs> but uh, is, you know, he, he, he understands in the context of his work that it's not just a dream space. It's a, it's a space in which he's dreaming on behalf of other people in a specific context. So he's talking about what it costs. And he's, he's already, I mean, the, the I, Mark may have a, a little of a disease where he takes things off the list before I would want him to, because he goes, oh, we could never, we could never do that. That's not affordable. I mean, not to say he doesn't dream about things that we can't afford. He does. But in any case, it, the, the, I think the, the, the joy, it's just, it's, it's reading all the time. It's knowing what's out there. It's being aware of these are, and it's, it's sort of just being an antenna and then maybe I'm a maybe I'm just a, a small part of the array over to the side somewhere saying, well, well, maybe what about this? Well, maybe what about this? And you know, ultimately, Mark takes it all in from his team, synthesizes it, and this is my favorite thing to say is then he eventually goes away and the white smoke goes up and we have a season. <laughs> <laughs> and truly, that's how it, it it just has to work that way, ultimately. So someone has to decide. Yeah. And uh, we're, we're actually we're very, very lucky in Westport that we have somebody uh, who, who thinks about it as, as thoughtfully as Mark does. Now, was the summer when Trace and I worked, I apprenticed in 1964 four or five, I think. But anyway, it was the summer stock model. Is that gone? Is that model gone across the country? I mean, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. It, yeah. Not, not, it hasn't disappeared. It's not extinct, but it's, it, it's probably not exactly like the model you remember. And it's, it's certainly much changed and, and much diminished. Yeah. Well, and good, but it's and nice. What summer stock trying out new play plays? Is it? What was that? Well, Summerstock was traveling, as I remember it. You know, you get how you get Elliot Gould, you get Shelley Winters, you get Maureen O'Sullivan, you get their actors off season. Oh, famous plays that were already well known. Oh, yeah. Come blow your horn. And, I mean, it was yeah. all these, and it would just go from place to place to place. And I think, I don't know, I think the scenery came with it too. Or maybe you'd, mm -hmm. I remember painting some flats and stuff. So I think maybe the each playhouse did their own there, theater. Right. There would be, there would be as many productions as there were stops on the circuit. And yeah. they would build you would you would build the production and rehearse the production in one place, and then two weeks later it would go on to the next place, yeah. and on and on and on. Um, and once uh, theaters started falling out of that, you know, it's closing because they couldn't financially sustain it. It then made the financial model for that kind of touring impossible. It just it doesn't work anymore. You just can't make them, you can't make the math work. Yeah. yeah, and it and it doesn't and it this is a much more I don't know vibrant model i mean obviously yours it's original you're i mean i remember you know i mean you've done a lot of great productions but a thousand pines now that came out of that was a great that was so timely so amazing thank you so and much fresh and fresh you know so it, it, how did you hear about that well yeah. we developed it i mean in a sense we we began this new works initiative it was one of the first scripts that came to us i can't remember really who i i suppose it in austin it was Austin Pendleton. It was Austin Pendleton. Yeah. yeah. Um, he didn't. He didn't direct the workshop though. Right. No, uh, that's. Uh, did he? He, he direct? Yes, I because I remember him eating a fish sandwich. Yes, he did. <laughs> You're right. He did because I remember asking him about straight white men. He had been in it. He, oh, right. Duh. There okay. We go. All the. But at any rate, the play uh, came to us, and. And we thought, well, it's it's very powerful. We should read it and, and let the playwright hear it. So he assembled a cast, brought in Austin Pendleton, and um, did a reading for us, just a small group of us, Michael and I and a few other people. And when it was over, I think we just said, we were going to produce this play. Matthew. I came up to you afterwards, and I, I just said, we have to. We have yeah. to. We're just going to do yeah. this. It's so good and it's so ready to go and why and, and where we are right i mean being down the road from newtown it just doesn't yeah. no other theater could do this play right yeah so it was that was serendipitous you know that oh, okay. somebody found matthew matthew had written this play about about the aftermath of how families deal with the aftermath of school shootings we read it he made some he tinkered with it a bit but not too much i think we read it one more time in New York, and we had we were casting it, so we were very very proud of that, and it did generate 
to be honest with you, uh, uh, money for commissions from uh, foundations who mm. appreciated the, the play itself and a, a foundation, particularly the Lawrence Hatcher Foundation, which supports a socially relevant uh, theater. Um, so we have now three commissions for three more plays due to that. One of which is Matthew uh, Green. So Another one is of Matthew. Full, full circle. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it certainly points up the, the advantage of, of being your own, producing and developing your own work, because that would never happen in Summerstock. Summerstock was just, I mean, it's a bad fluff. I mean, it was just entertainment. You get to see a Hollywood star on the stage for a little bit, but it had no, you know, there was no great substance to any of those things. But, um, but anyway, before we wrap it up, what you want to just, uh, you should tell people where to get, can they buy... If they look at the season and they go, well, I'm not, I don't want to see a musical. I just want, can they buy an individual ticket? And what is the seat? They can buy a season, right? How does it work? They can only buy subscriptions. They, okay. figure, they have to. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Of, course, of course, of course, they can buy single tickets. They can buy subscriptions. We also have group sales available. I encourage them to go to westportplayhouse.org. Um, it is it is the, the the thing that I always have to emphasize to people is it, it, there is a there's a price point for everyone. If there is a, if you have an identity as a student, as a senior, there is a discount for you, right? This is, this is your community theater and the parking is free. Why would you go to New York when we're making, when we're making work like this? Yeah. The, the yeah. Could end up right? tickets, paying. tickets start at $20, westportplayhouse.org. Great. Any, any last things that we overlooked you want to put in there that before we say goodbye? Any Mark? Are you I, feeling I, overlooked? What you guys do? No, Michael. I can't think of anything really. I'm generally overlooked, but I'm feeling okay. <laughs> well, also, I just want to extend. To, you were talking about all the partnerships and things, and and of course, it must express gratitude from the Artists Collective of Westport, who you gen, uh, graciously host there uh, on occasion in your barn, and we are grateful. And uh, that's your art. You're so. Uh, opportune that you're sitting and standing in, uh, in front of artwork there because uh, <laughs> you're a collective there might be a future well, my, collective member there <laughs> my yeah. seven-year-old has seen the artist collective shows and has very much enjoyed them he's also very uh, judgmental so I, I won't tell you which parts he likes <laughs> himself, I don't want to I don't want he's a good That's critic right. uh, but I got to that just to, to we'll end on this because it's a wonderful positive note that as far as community partnerships we've engaged in, that was the easiest yes in the world because the question came from Ann Sheffer. And it's been one of the most uh, sort of surprisingly joyful. I, we knew it would be joyful, but when you guys are in there doing an opening on a Thursday night, we'd otherwise be dark. That to me is how this should work. The place yeah. is alive. So yeah. thank you. Yeah, we love having you, Max. Oh, well, thanks so much. So it's mutual and uh, we appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to my... Uh, into the new season and uh, I have my tickets I, I have a very special price point my chair is out in the parking lot actually <laughs> but it's very affordable <laughs> no I have a regular seat somewhere in there but um, thank you very much yeah thanks for thank, coming. You. thank you Trace